On the program today, hike in aviation fuel prices triggers flight delays while operators count their losses. Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority issues safety guidelines for drone operators. Plus, solar plane lands in Arizona on its round-the-world journey. Hello and welcome to your number one aviation program, Flight 101. I'm Lillian Ezema. Flight time is 30 minutes, fasten your seatbelts, relax and enjoy the trip. Keep the price of Jet A1, otherwise known as aviation fuel, and the depreciating value of the nation's currency have been identified as major challenges affecting the growth of the airline subsector in Nigeria. Experts have called for strengthening of the local airlines. Other identified challenges are the high cost of providing standard air transport services, increasing demand for customer satisfaction by air travelers, and rising cost of operation. The shortage of aviation fuel has not only hampered flight operations, it has left air travelers waiting endlessly at the airports, with airlines counting their losses. I was supposed to take off by 4 p.m. this evening, and I've just been informed some few minutes ago that the flight will be coming from Lagos by 7 o'clock which means I have to leave after 7 or by 8 o'clock to get to Lagos by maybe 9 o'clock. And I'm still going to Abe Akuta. So when I get to Lagos, how am I going to get a bus to Abe Akuta? Then even yesterday too, I was supposed to board by 5 p.m. from Lagos to Abuja. We boarded 8 o'clock. And I got to Abuja after 9. There was no place to stay. And we are all complacent. Nobody's talking. They can delay flight for two hours, for three hours. All of the airlines, not only that one. And I think we have value. They should respect our value. They should respect us. We all have reasons where we are traveling. You can't believe it. In the morning, my flight was 8.40 because I came this morning. Because we eventually traveled at 11.50. And as such, I was, it was difficult for me to meet. In fact, I was praying that I could meet my appointment. Operators estimated that domestic airlines have lost more than 4 billion naira in revenue since the scarcity. Their equipment are underutilized and this has technical consequences. This aviation analyst is of the opinion that airlines could explore cheaper options of getting aviation fuel. African Airline Association is a, is a body of uh, airlines in Africa, uh, airlines registered in Africa, and I think um, they, they, they usually deal with airlines, not with government. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that, as of today, we do not have any Nigerian airline that's a member of that association. Why we did not have is because they have not been able to meet up with their commitments and uh, to the body. And so today, some, some airlines were there in the past. Um, Aero, Virgin Nigeria, but today you don't have a Nigerian airline. And you just talked about weakness. This association buys fuel in bulk. They negotiate on behalf of member, member airlines. So they can go to different countries, be able to, they, to negotiate and get a reduced price for their member carriers. But today, our carriers are not involved. So you see what you find out, you see that you see our Nigerian airlines buying fuel individually, and that's why you see the price of the aviation fuel is high and a, 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 a high um, um, operational cost for airlines. Because we're doing it, they're doing it individually. Not, it is when you do it jointly, they're able to get the price down. And what is one of the effects that is draining the resources of the Nigerian carriers and affecting their operational progress? Director General of the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority, Muta Usman, stated that human and cargo traffics at many airports, not just in Nigeria, but also around the world, had dwindled, with the declining purchasing power of passengers and shippers. For the NCAA bus, major carriers are diverting into low-cost operations in order to meet up with current challenges in the sector, stressing that they now resort to the use of smaller and more fuel-efficient aircraft. Usman disclosed that the bigger challenge at the moment for Nigeria and many other countries was creating a friendlier and more enabling environment for airlines and indeed the economic activities to flourish to enable a sustainable air transport industry. The Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority has issued a warning over growing proliferation of the use of remotely piloted aircraft. The Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority, NCAA, 
has issued a warning over the growing proliferation of the use of remotely piloted aircraft. <laughs> the aviation regulatory body has issued safety guidelines over the use of the equipment in the airspace without permission. Spokesman for the NCAA, Sam Aduruboye, said that remotely piloted aircraft or unmanned aerial vehicles are being deployed for commercial and recreational purposes in the country without adequate security clearance. He noted that with the operations, particularly in a non-segregated airspace, there has to be proactive security guidelines. The authority further stated that the development of the use of remotely piloted aircraft or unmanned aerial vehicles nationwide has emerged with somewhat predictable safety concerns and security threats. The International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, is yet to publish standards and recommended practices as far as certification and operation of civil use of remotely piloted aircraft is concerned. Aduro Boye noted that the NCAA has therefore put in place advisory circular to guide the certification and operations of civil remotely piloted aircraft in the Nigerian airspace. This is contained in the Nigerian Civil Aviation Regulations and Implementing Standards. Therefore, no government agency, organization or an individual will launch a remotely piloted aircraft in the Nigerian airspace for any purpose whatsoever without obtaining requisite approvals from the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority and Office of National Security Advisor. The regulators warned that violators shall be sanctioned according to the dictates of the Nigerian Civil Aviation Regulations. Aviation security expert John Ojikutu calls for coordinated intelligence gathering and sharing at the nation's airport. A member of aviation industry think tank group, Aviation Roundtable, John Ojikutu, said that to evade what transpired at Brussels airport, where terrorists detonated explosives at the airport, there is need to coordinate intelligence and security efforts by gathering and adequately sharing information across board. The former airport commandant emphasized that the lessons from Brussels airport goes beyond airport security, calling for a national aviation security policy which emphasizes the role of intelligence in the gamut. The lessons from the Brussels terrorist attack is beyond airport security alone. It is more about national aviation security and the role of intelligence in the aviation security defense layers. There are about six layers of defense in aviation security. <clears throat> the first layer is intelligence. How does intelligence work? How does intelligence support aviation? Some of these people we are at least calling Boko Haram members. How many of them do we know? How many of them have we listed? Because normally you should have them in group. You'd rather list them as the ones that are not very we are not very critical about. You list them as uh, you list them. We put them on watch list. Because they are too late. We put them either on watch list. And the ones that you know already that are very they have that terrorist instinct in their body. And you put them on no fly list. We have a, a very elaborate security measure that applies to both the internal and external publics. Uh, the external publics are people that relate with us who are not staff of uh, the Federal Airport Authority, while the external are people, are internal, are our own staff. And uh, for anybody you see in the airport, that person must have undergone vigorous security check. Uh, and we have different levels of checks that uh, expose uh, that, that exposes airport workers to different levels of the airport. Uh, in simple terms, it's not every staff that the Federal Airport that works with the Federal Airport Authority that has access to the airport. For you to have access, you must have passed through security training by the relevant security organizations uh, in the country, and um, you must also undergo our own internal security checkup and after which you will be given a color that will restrict you to the level of uh, exposure you will have 
in, in and around the airport. Ojikutu said it took Nigeria about eight years before putting faces of those within the domestic terrorist cell before the military started putting them and their names on the watch list. For him, security is about intelligence or security agencies sharing names on the watch list with airlines and airport operators. It is about the immigration services sharing passenger names records with other countries on principle of reciprocity as it is done between the U.S. and European countries. Now international stories. A solar-powered plane midway through an attempt to circle the globe finished the next leg of its history-making journey in Arizona after a relatively short 16-hour flight from Northern California, United States of America. The California to Arizona flight marked the 10th leg. Borchberg was a pilot for the Japan to Hawaii trip over the Pacific last July, during which he remained airborne for nearly 118 hours, or five days and five nights. That shattered the 76-hour world duration record for a non-stop solo flight set in 2006 by the late American adventurer Steve Fawcett in his Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer. It also set new duration and distance records for solar-powered flight. It was a day where the, where the music made me very emotional. And when you are up there, when you can fly, in fact, with the, with the sun, when you have this potential, uh, the airplane doesn't make any noise, uh, doesn't make uh, any, uh, any pollution. I mean, you feel, you feel different, and the music made me almost cry. So, uh, so, the, so, the, so that's, that's, that's the part which touched me most today. The feat dealt a setback to the Solar Impulse team. The plane sustained severe battery damage on the flight from Japan during requiring repairs and testing that kept the aircraft grounded in Hawaii for nine months. The biggest difference is that the Solar Impulse flies without a drop of fuel. The four engines of the propeller-driven aircraft are powered solely by energy collected from more than 17,000 solar cells built into its wings. Surplus power is stored in four batteries during daylight hours to keep the plane flying overnight, allowing it to remain aloft around the clock on extreme long-distance flights. I, w I had a, a lot of tailwind today, so I was going too fast. Uh, so uh, to, to slow down, I started to fly backwards. I was uh, flying not as fast as the wind, so the wind was pushing me backwards here to a good year because it was important to land after sunsets when the air is a bit less, less turbulent. So you have to adapt, you know, and, uh, and find new, new strategies. Uh, but the great advantage of this airplane is that you don't have to, uh, to land. I mean, you don't have to refuel. So uh, you can stay in the air. You can stay in the air almost forever. The carbon fiber plane with a wingspan exceeding that of a Boeing 747 and the weight of a family car is unlikely to set any speed or altitude records. It can climb gradually to 28,000 feet and its cruising speed ranges from 34 to 62 miles per hour. The Swiss team hopes eventually to complete its circumnavigation in Abu Dhabi, where its journey began in March 2015 as part of a campaign to bolster support for clean energy technologies. In a precursor to their globe circling quest, the two men completed a multi flight crossing of the United States with an earlier version of the solar plane in 2013. Welcome to our personality interview segment, The Aviator. Our guest is still Deleore. The former president Aviation Roundtable recalled federal government support to the aviation sector, what the future holds for pilots, and issues on bilateral air services agreements. Deleore studied both in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. He obtained his LLB from University of Lagos, other educational institutions attended include Oxford Air Training Center, Oxford and London Business School, London. Captain Dilio Ores started his career as a pilot, second officer Nigeria Airways, 
He occupied the following positions Captain, Presidential Fleet, Chief Pilot and Director of Flight Operations of the airline. He was also the former President Aviation Roundtable. Except something drastic, some drastic steps are taken, such as making concrete policy that must be implemented, except we strong, strong, strongly energize the domestic carrier who are now <laughs> the, the weight of making a safe operation is heavy on them because of the cost of operation, because of the foreign exchange rate, because of fuel uh, uh, <laughs> that is not available and very high cost of training, high cost of maintenance. All that, one or two items, we weigh against the foreign carrier. But all these weigh against a domestic carrier. And you will ask the question, where are all these 40, about 40 licenses or 100 licenses already issued to Nigerians? Where only about, as of today, less than 10 are in operation, including general aviation. And these 10 can only take as much as they need for their own operation, based on the number of aircraft, based on the route network, based on their own approved routes, and also operations uh, requirement. And so they cannot take more than they require. All the others will roam the, the street, unfortunately. Where you know that that, uh, that you know the founders and uh, those that mentored that tree school, I would say we need to praise their courage. We need to praise the fact that they were forward-looking. That that school was not; it it was actually in conjunction with the. Akeo, and it was meant to be a regional center, not just a localized center, so that it will be taking care and providing top, you know, you know, high tech training for the sub region, the whole of West Africa, the whole of East Africa, and the whole of Africa. That was what it was meant for, to be a center of excellence for aviation training in the whole of Africa. And so it started well, but within two, three years, the usual government policy, the usual, uh, something definitely went wrong to the extent that rather than train, training a pilot for just 18 months, Two months, it was taking six years. Okay? All right. Because there was no compelling need at that time. Because there was still there were still enough Nigerians, even though you know they were still there that could be used. These Nigerians have expired now. Like my good self. I can only try to inspire the young pilots now. I have expired. I can, except in an emergency, if I get into an aeroplane to help them put it down, I cannot legally fly an aeroplane because this law, at 60, you finish. 65, 60 to 65, you could still have somebody supervising you. After 65, it's all done. Except the aeroplane belongs to you, commercially, you can no longer fly. So, it is now when we re realized that this shortage was imminent, there was no big rush to train because there was no requirement for, because the airline were not doing too well. So the, the future, in the near future, there will be terrible shortage because those who have ex expired due to age and not they cannot be replaced by those who have sufficient experience. 
They could be on the job for 15 years and still not having the requisite number of hours to be upgraded as commander. Unfortunately, we would in future, if we do not do something about the, the carriers, and the carriers, so many things weighing against them, especially if, if they have aircraft, where do they maintain the aircraft? This will have been the best thing to ever happen to the industry. Unfortunately, maintenance, repairs, and overhaul facilities should have been the first before you are getting more modern machine. Because for each machine you have, you need to consider where you are going to maintain them. And these maintenance facilities are not available here because we didn't plan properly. It is not the business of government to build those facilities, but they must provide the neighboring environment for investors to come and establish those things. You will find that uh, uh, <laughs> the number of people, the engineers, administrators, economies that such that will be required for such MRO will be enormous. And we are not talking of just one. We're probably talking about six, in, one in each in the ge geopolitical axis of this country because one type of aircraft, the MRO can specialize. Another one will specialize in the other one. There are some other. So you find that it's not just one that will be enough, so several, at least six. Because right now, we just have some hangars that can just uh, do some uh, small, small uh, maintenance on light aircraft. Whereas, you can see the big aircraft that are coming in and out of Nigeria now dictates that if you do not want to kill the domestic carrier that want to fly and operate those aircraft, you must have done your research to establish the MRO. And the MRO relay Several investors will have been interested in it because, uh, <laughs> although it's a pro pro it is a project that will have very long uh, ingestion time before they can start making money and all that, but on the long run, for the survival of the industry, it is required. And for those who want to have long investment plan, it's also a very good uh, thing, a very good project to look into besides providing job for Nigerians. And as long as our domestic carrier have to fly aircraft to far distance outside this country for maintenance, they can never, never make money out of their operation. At the long run, they have to queue up for the aircraft to come in. They have to fly the aircraft there, ferry the aircraft there without, with no revenue and they have to take support staff, technical staff, to go there to at least supervise the maintenance. Because the ultimate responsibility for airworthiness of the aircraft is that of the operator. So they must, it doesn't matter whether somebody else is doing the maintenance for them, they must send somebody there to go and oversee that the maintenance is being done according to procedure and uh, to meet our safety requirement. Well, whether we are signing with uh, Zulu Airline or Yankee Airline, but let's say a agreement has just one basic definition. It's an, it is an agreement between two st states. And it could be many more states, but then it becomes multi multilateral. But the balance is between two and the more let's decide and define what we really want to do in between us. As you said, unfortunately, I don't have the content of that of the quarter, but I can make, I make bold to tell you that by last year's agreement, you have what we can say a model here, that 
Afra is, is propagating that the Nigerian uh, company, government and also other states who don't even have the technical, technical knowledge how to negotiate because it's an intricate, very, very strict and delicate balancing of interests. You need experts to negotiate bilateral service agreement. The first woman in the U.S. to become licensed to fly a plane was Harriet Quimby in 1911. She was also the first woman to fly across the English Channel. Amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She also helped create the 1990s, which was an organization for female pilots, who also achieved many other notable accomplishments. The world's largest passenger plane is the Airbus A380. It's a double-decker four-engine jetliner. It made its first flight on April 27, 2005. That's it on the program this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Liliane Zemark. Bye.